uh, one of the re that's why he said to do this oft in remembrance of him because it is a reminder uh, that he did give us his best the father gave that part of him that is love and what uh, great price he paid for our sin debt uh, as we come today to worship him book of Hebrews chapter 13 uh, I'm going to speak this morning on the driving force of the Christian life the driving force of the Christian life we're going to read the first six verses uh, of that text Hebrews right before the book of James thinking on the driving force of the Christian life when you find your places if you'll stand in honor and reverence of God's word we'll begin reading Hebrews chapter 13 beginning verse 1 let brotherly love continue be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For you have said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You can be seated. Thank you. Pray with me if you would. Father, we thank you again for the freedom um, and the liberty to read the Word of God. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to stand down and pre preach and proclaim uh, the Word of God. We thank you for the opportunity to come to the Lord's table. Lord, it allows us to examine ourselves, Lord, to see where we're at in our relationship and our fellowship with you but also in our relationship and fellowship with one another. And Lord, I pray that you'd challenge us. I pray you'd convict us. Lord, I'm just a mail carrier. Lord, I, my responsibility today is just to tell the people what thus saith the Lord. And I pray that I could do that in your strength and in your power. Not in my own ability do I speak, Lord, but in the anointing of God. I stand today and preach, Lord, the voice of God. Again, I pray that you'd speak in me and through me. And Lord, may I get out of the way now and just let you be God. And Lord, I pray you'd speak to us individually. You speak to us collectively. And Lord, you draw us nigh to you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Many believe, most Bible scholars, that this is sort of the cover letter. Uh, Hebrews is a difficult book, and we know that there's at least five caution passages you have to separate and isolate from the book to tie in with the main theme of the book. The whole book is about the superiority of Christ. Uh, and understanding that, 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 some believe that chapter 13 is, is as a cover letter, as I've already said, from Paul concerning the whole letter of Hebrews. Uh, the summation of the whole book is the fact that uh, love determines every area of our Christian life. Uh, the subject matter really seems to be living by faith. When you go back to chapter 11, uh, we see the great examples of faith. There he mentions all the patriarchs throughout the scripture, uh, in the Old Testament particularly. In chapter 12, we see the encouragement of faith. He talks about us getting heavy and tired and weary, and he gives an illustration of a runner uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, su uh, swagging hands and legs and the knees getting weak, and he and tries to bring encouragement, the encouragement of faith. And then in chapter 13, he comes back now to the evidences of faith. Uh, and let me say this. I, Warren Wiersbe said, there's no division between doctrine and duty, uh, revelation and responsibility. Uh, no, there's no distinction or division between belief and behavior. Usually, in every one of those areas, doctrine always reflects our duty. Uh, and also, revelation uh, declares our responsibility, and belief will, will determine behavior. Uh, and, and many of these first century believers, as you read the book of Hebrews, need, we need to understand this morning that they had professed Jesus Christ, but something happened. You see, as they left Judaism to Christianity and they acknowledged Jesus Christ as their Savior, uh, there would begin to inf be an influx of, of attacks. Uh, many of those who profess Christ immediately begin to face persecution. And many of them Paul's writing to are on the verge of 
wandering back. They're turning back now. They found it's much easier to follow the rigors of Judaism than it is to live in the liberty of Jesus Christ. Many of them, as you understand what they were going to, they were facing the threats, uh, multiple threats. They were they were threat, under the threats of losing their homes. Uh, some of them were being threatened with losing their jobs. Some of them were threatened by losing their land. And many of them were even, even left out of the social guilds. And they were really losing their reputations for acknowledging Jesus Christ as their Savior. So you sort of see what they're up against. And Paul comes back in this 13th chapter once again, and he talks about living by faith. The evidence is of faith. What did this faith look like? You see, their greatest threat, ladies and gentlemen, was turning away from Jesus. That was their greatest threat. And can I say that's our greatest threat too, is walking away from a relationship and a fellowship with Jesus Christ and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they had to make a choice between covetousness and commitment to Christ. And you see that right in the heart of the text. Uh, in verse chapter, verse number 5, he says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. That's the key element of those first five verses. Well, in order to understand what those uh, ideologies about what he's mentioned here, you've got to look at the whole context. And that's what we'll do here. You see, the bottom line is this. Is our, if our love relationship with Christ is not right, it's going to affect every part of our obedience to God's word and God's will for our lives. Bottom line. Uh, and that's what where he's getting to. If we understand that Jesus is superior to everything, that's what the whole book's about. It's about Jesus being superior to the law. Uh, Jesus being superior. If, if we understand that Jesus is superior to everything and everybody, there are going to be four things out of this text that we've got to realize. These four things will show us whether we're really living by faith or whether we're not. First of all, uh, there's an attitude to reject in verse 5. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. In other words, when he, that word conversation, he's not talking about necessarily speech or verbal, uh, uh, verbal atonement. He's speaking of a lifestyle, uh, your conduct, your, your mannerisms, your conduct, your lifestyle. He says, let your lifestyle, your conduct, the, the way you live, be without covetousness. In other words, one translation says, don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. But I want to say that covetousness is not so much a money matter. Covetousness is a pretty broad matter. Uh, it's a matter of the heart, basically. That's what covetousness is. It's wanting something you shouldn't want or wanting something you shouldn't be desiring. Uh, and that's the idea of covetousness. Uh, I'm reminded of one writer said this, that times of suffering can either be times of selfishness or times of service. You know, I journeyed back when I thought about that statement back to COVID. We saw a lot of people sacrificially serving, didn't we? A lot of people going beyond the means to, 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 to suit up and to take care of patients. We saw people giving and helping. And Listen, the, thank God for the people in this church that gave sacrificially during that time to carry the load that the church didn't go under. By the way, there's some ch churches closed today because people didn't give and tithe during COVID. And they're shut down today and they're not in operation. But thank God for grace and for people who love the church and love the body of Christ of South Africa. More bad to church. So uh, during that time, we saw people who were, uh, they either showed selfishness or service. We saw uh, who, and I heard some guys talking the other day in line. Uh, Renee and I were somewhere, and the guy behind us said, You know, I, I, I can't believe that we were we were fighting over toilet paper. And I thought, well, Where did this come from? And let me know where he's talking about toilet paper. Uh, but anyhow, he, it's because he was waiting in line, and somebody didn't know how to use their debit card. And he said, I don't know why they got that thing if they don't know how to use it. Why don't you just pay for cash? And anyhow, Anyhow, he went on and on. I said, man, he's got issues. But anyhow, we'll move on from there. I just, that comes to my mind. Uh, but times of suffering can either be times of selfishness, selfishness or times of service. And that's exactly what Paul's writing about here in Hebrews because these folks are in a time of suffering. Uh, they're going to be persecuted for leaving Judaism. And listen, they were on the point they could either turn back to Judaism or they could either serve the Lord Jesus Christ by grace through faith. I'm reminded of what Jesus said. He said, no man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Here's the question we've got to ask ourselves in this first point of the outline this morning of the message. Will we pursue our goals and dreams without money as our focus? I think that's what Paul's getting at. But it's deeper than that. I think it goes deeper. Here, here's what he's saying. Go back to verse 1 through verse 3. 
He said, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds. You see, some of them have been imprisoned. Some have been, been already been faced persecution. He says, if, if, if you were bound with them, put yourself in their shoes, and then which suffer adversity. There are some that have been persecuted because of their, of their stand for Christ and their uh, forsaking uh, Judaism, as being yourselves also in the body. You see, Here's what he's getting at. He's leading into this statement of verse 5 and verse 6 by showing us some examples. First of all, if material things are, listen, are our focus, it will affect our Christian compassion. If material things, monetary things, are our focus, it's going to affect our Christian compassion. He says that really in verse 1 through verse 3. He says, let brotherly love continue. Be, be uh, not forgetful to entertain strangers because some of you have entertained angels unaware. Remember those that are in bonds, those that have, pers have been suffered for, uh, suffered adversity for Christ's sake. It could be you just like it is them is what he's saying. In other words, he's bringing them and he's showing them if material things are our focus, it'll affect our Christian compassion. He says, be careful. Be careful because there's things that in your life, uh, if, you get your, if you get your attitude wrong, if you get your attitude wrong, it's going to affect your compassion. But look at verse, verse 4. It's also going to affect your Christian chastity. He said, marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. It's almost like these things don't fit, and you, all of a sudden he changes gears when he go, goes back into verse 5. So you'll understand why he's saying what he's saying when you realize what he's talking about. He's talking about an attitude re to reject. These material things, these material objects he's mentioned, that Christian compassion and Christian chastity will be affected when we, ha we, have, when we have covetousness at the root of our heart. You know, I, I thought about this. He says, he says, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. He says, God's going to judge those who are immoral and, and who commit adultery. He said, given the idea here of those who just keep on doing it and keep on doing it, keep on doing it. I'm reminded, you know, you can get about all the marriage counseling you need out of Genesis 2.24. Really, you can. You that are couples today, let me help you today. He says three things in Genesis 2.24. He says, first of all, we're to leave. There's more problems in marriage today because, uh, listen, she runs the mama and he runs the daddy. Listen, you're to leave mother and father and become one. First of all, it involves leaving, and then it involves cleaving. Just stick like glue. Hey, that's what it literally means. It means to stick like glue. Leave, cleave. Stick like, like glue regardless, and then it says to become one flesh. Leave, cleave, and die. <laughs> you say, well, we're about to kill each other. Well, you might be, but that's not the die I'm talking about, all right? There's another death that has to take place. Do you realize when you leave your mother and father and you cleave to one another, you're constantly dying to yourself? You're dying to self. You, you have to start dying to self. Somebody has to continually die to self. And that's what makes it so complicated because when we have the wrong attitude and when we have, listen, when we have the, this idea of covetousness, when we want our way, when we want it to be like us, and we want it to be with no, with no observation or no consideration, when it's all about me and what I can get out of this and what I can gain, uh, listen, it's going to die, I promise you. But when it's centered around Christ and around the foot of the cross, hey, there's a leaving and there's a cleaving and there's a dying, a dying to my desires and my wants, and, and you yield to that other person. And as long as both of you are doing that toward the cross of Calvary and you're coming to Jesus, you're both dying to self and you're going to be yielding to Jesus. And you'll have a marriage, I promise you, that's blessed. You see, but here's the idea he's getting at. Don't miss it. If material things are our focus, it's going to affect our Christian compassion. That's what he says in the first three verses. And it's all going to so affect our Christian chastity. Where our, our being chaste, listen, is not going to be satisfying. There's going to be th illicit things in our lives that shouldn't be there. So material things, if they're our focus, that's what it affects. Okay, That's where he's going. He's leading us to this attitude we've got to reject. And these things lead to that attitude that he's dealing with. Let me just say, there, there's a tremendous uh, attack. As I stand before you and you sit in this building by the forces of evil upon the princes of a marriage this morning, let me just say this right, uh, for record. God's word has not changed. 
It has not changed, nor has his standard for the home and the marriage changed. And let me just, just reiterate this. That the rainbow doesn't belong to the LBGTQ. The rainbow belongs to God. It's a covenant between God and man that he'll never destroy the earth again by water. It's God's. Amen? And nobody can take that away. Well, there's an attitude to reject. But then there's also an appreciation to reflect. Look what he says in verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. That little idea of be content, it means to be, it means to be self-sufficient or self-contained. Uh, it, it means to be, it speaks of satisfaction. <laughs> In other words, I find my sufficiency and my self-worth and my satisfaction in life in Jesus Christ. I don't find my uh, peace and my su sufficiency and my satisfaction in what I've got on. Uh, it doesn't matter, listen, if I buy something from Dollar General or over at over at Belks. Listen, uh, it's been satisfied. I'm, it's not in my dress. Uh, it, it's not in the neighborhood that I live in. It's not in the school that I attend. It's not in the position that I have in the public or of authority. It's none of those things. Listen, contentment cannot come from material things, for they can never satisfy the heart. And that's exactly what Paul's getting at. These folks are facing persecution, and they're trying to find contentment. But he says, be content with such things as you have. Be, be self-contained. Be self-sufficient. Find satisfaction. And folks, once again, let me re reiterate. <laughs> you and I have to find our self-sufficient, like, listen, our sufficiency and self-worth in Jesus Christ. If you're expecting the world to define who you are, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. If you're expecting somebody else to define who you are or you're allowing somebody to define who you are, you're going down the wrong road, I promise you. Your, your defining comes only from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one. He's the one you'll stand before as the final judge and you'll give an account to him for what you've done in your Christian life and how you served him. Listen, Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, he said, well, let me paraphrase, he said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We live in a culture that we let our possessions define who we are. Our possessions, our material things, listen, are try, many are trying to find their contentment in this and that and everything else. And it's leading to great, great consequences. And I could go on with, and on and on with statistics, but they'd bore you to death. But it's amazing today to see the result of some folks that, that they're experiencing heart attacks, ulcers, and all types of other things because they're trying to find their commitment in these things I've mentioned. They're trying to find their com contentment in things of the world, in the neighborhood they live in, uh, the school they attend, the position they have, and what they put on and what they wear who they hang out with, and who they can impress. Folks, none of those things are going to make any difference in eternity. Listen to what Philipp, Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. He said, Now that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, and I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Paul come to that place when he realized, listen, there was a difference between his needs and his wants. Paul, listen, Paul showed us that there's an appreciation to reflect. Paul, in the midst of a dung-filled uh, prison, damp and dreary, locked up, listen, excluded from everybody, found his sufficiency in Jesus Christ. He found his self-worth, listen, in Jesus Christ. He realized through those dark times of his life, listen, that his self-worth was not in what he could do, it was in Jesus Christ. Let me remind you, Paul wasn't a, the dummy on the block. He knew at least six languages fluently. He's a very educated man. He was a Jew of the Jews. He was a renowned leader. He was on his way of, of making progress to being one of the next great leaders and understand he was persecuting Christians till he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. Hey, and when you meet Jesus, you realize that your sufficiency is nothing, but then through him you can do all things. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote to young Timothy. 
He, uh, Timothy probably in one of the most difficult churches there was other than the Corinth was over in Ephesus. He was young. He was timid. Uh, he was very bashful and sort of laid back. Was and he had to address church behavior. And, and uh, Paul writes to him and he says, "Listen, let me remind you, Timothy. Uh, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content." Uh, he was going through some stomach ulcer problems, probably. And Paul writes to him, he says, Timothy, let me need to understand there's a cost. There's a cost, Timothy, for godliness and contentment. But in, he says there's an appreciation to reflect. That's what he says in verse 5 of the book of Hebrews. And then thirdly, I want you to notice with me, he says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you hath. Notice he says, for he hath said... He's talking about God. For God has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Well, that makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? In whatever situation you face, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. There's thirdly, there's an awareness to recognize. There's an awareness to recognize. First of all, we'll look at the setting of this promise. Uh, this setting of this promise actually comes from Psalm 118, verse 6. Listen to what the psalmist said. He said, for the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. And he asked a question. What can man do unto me? Uh, and we know that... Uh, we know for sure David faced some enemies. He was, a, he was a, a warrior for God. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6. Uh, once again it says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. He says, For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Almost exactly what the writer of Hebrews says in Paul, I believe, in his writings. He was actually, he was actually reminding these same, uh, same believers of the same thing God reminded of the children of Israel back in, the, in that Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. That's the setting of the promise that we find here in verse 5. It's a messianic promise that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ so we can also claim the promise. You see, when we come to this table, this verse reminds us, listen, because he's already died. Listen, he's died for our sin. We don't have to die for our sin. We don't have to die because of our sin. He died for our sin, but we have a responsibility to die to sin because he's died for our sin. That's why this table is so important, because it reminds us. That's why he said do it often. He reminds us that we're to be supposed to be dying to that rotten flesh. We're to be dying to self continually. And the more you cater to the flesh, you've got to be very careful, because it's according to which dog you feed the most, the dog that's going to win, I promise you. If you don't fill yourself with spiritual things, and you fill yourself with fleshly things and worldly things, guess where you're going to find yourself? You're going to find yourself living like the world, serving the world, and you can't tell a difference between you and the world. That's what he's saying. The, the setting of this promise. It, it's a messianic promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled Psalm 118 and Deuteronomy 31. But look look at the sureness of this promise. Uh, somebody said that men might take their goods, but God would meet their need. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Uh, here in this verse, he says, With such things as you have, be content. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. There's an awareness to recognize. He's promised he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Now, we might leave him. We might depart in our fellowship with him. But if you've been saved, you can never lose your relationship and thank God for that. But you can waste away your fellowship and get out of fellowship. But there's an awareness to recognize. And then look at verse 6. There's an assurance. There's an assurance, I want to say, to revive. He said, Let's read it together, verse 5 and 6. He says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Listen to verse 6. So that we may boldly say. Okay. Here's why he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. John Phillips said this. You see, there's an assurance to revive. Folks, we live in a day when folks, uh, our assurance needs to be revived. We look around us, we see the chaos, we see the confusion, we see all the disturbances, we see the negligence, we see the half-heartedness all around us today in our world. And listen, we, we need to go back to Calvary. We need to go back to the communion table. We need to go back and reset some things. Listen to what Philip said. He said, men, be, men can be cruel, and the fear of men can be a real snare. To for, to, for the soul. 
that none of us could really say for sure how we might react when faced with torture, prison, and the stake, but God give us grace in a time of need. Amen? Uh, how true that is. Folks, the driving force of the Christian life is, listen, is God's love for us and our love for Him. Look what he says in that verse once again. So that we may boldly say, boldly say, He's talking about confidence there. We need to, listen, we need the boldness once again to say, I'm going to stand for the things of God. I'm going to stand for the cause of right. Whether no one else stands or not, I'm going to stand for Jesus. Amen. I'm going to stand for this word. Whether anybody else does or not, listen, I'm going to be content in what he's blessed me with. My life is going to honor him. I'm not going to pursue and desire those things outside the rim of, rims of God's word. I'm going to tra stay true as I can to the fibers of the word of God and live with a standard in my life. Listen, if I find myself swaying and wandering away, I'm going to come back and I'm going to make a commitment to renew my fellowship and my relationship with Him. There's an assurance to revive. And He says, when we do that, we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I don't know about you, but I can stand this morning and say the, boldly, the Lord is my helper. I'd hate to think where I was at today if it hadn't been for the grace of God. I'd hate to even think where I'd be today if it wasn't for his goodness and his kindness on my life. Listen, if he wasn't helping me, I, I promise you I wouldn't be up here right now if he wasn't helping me. I promise you. Uh, and you wouldn't be here this morning if he hadn't helped you get out of bed. Uh, but listen, you can't do anything without him anyhow. But I'm glad. Listen, the sooner you realize that you can do nothing on your own, but through him you can do all things. Listen, sometimes we try to help God do this and help God do that. But listen, we need to be reminded that he is our helper. He's our helper. That word helper is an interesting word, and it's so broad. I don't know about you, but I find myself not needing his help just on Sunday. I'm glad he's there for my help Monday through Saturday, aren't you? He's my helper. And when we come to this table, we're reminded he's our helper. He does. He's not out to knock us down and kick out the props from underneath us and cause us to flop and fail. He's not out to destroy us. Listen, he came to give his life a ransom for us. He sent his son to die on a cross for us. Listen, he sent him to show us his great love for us. Hey, listen, he's got a lot invested in you. He's got a lot invested in me. He's got his darling son. He nailed him to a cross and he bled and he died and he faced the tortures of death. Listen, and he overcome death, hell, and the grave as he ascended to the lower parts and he pronounced, listen, destruction and doom on the devil and his angels. Listen, and he rose victorious. He's got a lot invested in us, doesn't he? Thank God. You see, he wants us to be our helper. He, ought to, he wants to be our helper, but we, here's the kicker. We've got to let him be our helper. He's not going to get us by the, out of the head and say, I'm going to be your helper whether you like it or not. Now, if you're a Christian, there's some things he orchestrates in your life and puts you in places where you need to be so he can get your higher brain to listen to him long enough. Amen? There's going to be some times, if you're here this morning, he wants to be your helper. If you've never been saved, he loves you. He gave his darling son for your sin. And he died for you, every one of us. If you were the only person here, he would have died for you because he's a God of love and a God of mercy and a God of grace. But, you know, the church I'm speaking to right now, those that are saved, we literally need the boldness once again, church, to say, I'm going to stand for the things of God. Let me come to conclusion this morning. As we talk about being the driving force of the Christian life, it's very clear. It's one. It's very clear. It's God's love for us and our love for Him that's that driving force. It's that relationship and fellowship that the unbeliever doesn't have. But because of that, I've named off these four things that ought to be a, that are a vital part of our lives, and we have to be very careful with that. We we fail not to incorporate those things into our life. You see, I thought about a courageous Christian because that's really what he's describing here. He's talking about the lifestyle, really, of a courageous Christian. And these believers had to be courageous or they were going to fall. Uh, they were going to they were going to go back to Judaism. They were going to face persecution if it didn't go back to Judaism. You see, courageous Christians are living lifestyles pleasing to the Lord. I believe that's the first thing he's saying. Courageous Christians are living lifestyles pleasing to the Lord. I, I wish I could tell you that it was easy serving the Lord Jesus Christ, but I could be the first one to tell you it's not. You see, because you're constantly dying to yourself and you're yielding to Jesus. Constantly. 
Not just one time a week. Not just the first time you get saved and you're baptized. Listen, from the time you accept Christ to the time you meet Jesus, whether it's, in the res whether, listen, whether it's by death or whether it's by the rapture or resurrection, listen, you're going to be facing, you're going to be facing constant persecution in your Christian life. You're going to be facing trials and tests and tribulations because you live in a world that's dominated by sin. You, you live in a world that, listen, living on the influx of Satan and demonic forces. Courageous Christians are living lifestyles pleasing to the Lord. Do you know that's your number one priority this morning? Your number one priority and responsibility is to please Jesus Christ. And then secondly, I believe only courageous Christians are living lifestyles pleasing to the Lord, but I believe Paul's saying something else here. He's saying content Christians are living with self-worth they have in Jesus Christ and not their own. You see, my self-worth and your self-worth this morning, if you're a believer, is not in, who, not in who you are, what you can achieve. Not what you've done or where you've been or where you're going in life. It's in Jesus Christ. He's the one who gives us sufficiency. He's the one that gives us self-worth. And that's what Paul was reminding them of. Listen, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't in going back to the law. It wasn't the answer. We sing that old song. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen? That's where our hope is, folks, today. That's where our hope. So we see very clearly this morning, when we think about the driving force of the Christian life, we see very clear it's God's love for us and our love for Him. There's an attitude. There's an attitude we have to reject. An attitude we have to reject. Our attitude's not like the world's like, world's attitude. It thinks about others. It's loving one another. It's loving one another. It's loving other people. Listen, it, it, it's staying clean and pure for one another. There's an attitude to reject. There's an appreciation to reflect. There's an awareness to recognize. And there's an assurance to revive. As I begin to sit down and prepare for this, there's so much packed in that fifth verse that so fits most of our lives. It's just phenomenal. Here's the question we got to ask ourselves this morning before we come to the Lord's table as our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning for the invitation. Danny, I'm going to have you to come and play. You see, this is a time in our Christian lives that's been appointed to the church. He said to do it all, the reason being because we have an opportunity to look at ourselves. So, And we have an opportunity, as you've heard me say many times, to judge ourselves so that we won't be judged. Simple, Four simple questions. Are you content this morning with who you are right now in Christ Jesus? Are you content? Are you, are you living in the self-worth of Jesus Christ? Is there satisfaction this morning in your life? Do you know if you died, you'd go to heaven? During this invitation right now, why wouldn't you in just a moment, when Danny plays, we're going to pray? Why wouldn't you step out of that aisle and come and say, I'm just trying to find my sufficiency in life in so many things. And I've heard, believed for the first time that it's Jesus. And God spoke in my heart this morning. I realized that I've been doing it all the wrong way. Looking for all the answers in all the wrong places. But I want to put my faith and my trust in Jesus this morning. And ask Him to be my Savior. You see, you can do that. You see, if you're not a Christian, you really have no communion with the folks that are here today. You see, the reason we come to this table is to examine our hearts and lives to make sure that we're where we need to be with Christ and with one another. But the believer can examine his or her life before they have the access to this table. You see, they can't come because they're not a part of the family of God. Why wouldn't you come this morning and say, Pastor, I need to become a member of the family of God. I need to trust Christ as my Savior. There's an attitude you need to reject. Satan's telling you all the wrong things. You're a good person. You've done this. You've done that. He's telling you you can just wait. You're going to be older. you got your life to live. Enjoy it now. And all those other things. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you're a Christian. Maybe this morning, as you think about what Paul's writing, maybe this morning you're trying to find your contentment in your self-worth instead of Jesus. 
Maybe you're trying to find your contentment in what you wear, where you go to school, where you work. And you've failed, found yourself in that subtle trap of Satan. And you need to refocus this morning. And there's an assurance in your relationship and fellowship with God that you need to revive. You need to come this morning and recommit your life to Christ. And say, I've wandered away. I've honestly departed my relationship and fellowship with God. And I'm going to seize this opportunity to come clean. So that I can come to the table of my Lord in peace. And with a reconciled heart and life. That I'm going to serve Him and honor Him with my life the way that I know I'm supposed to. Father, I've been obedient as I know how. Uh, to make this understandable and explained the way that it needs to. And Lord, I realize there's some great challenges in this text for the unbeliever. There's some challenges here as well for the believer. And Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us, Lord, before we come to this table individually and collectively. If there's one here on the sound of my voice that doesn't know that they'd die, that they'd go to heaven, I pray, Lord, that they'd walk that aisle this morning. They'd step out by faith and trust you as their Lord and their Savior. If there's one this morning that's saved and there's wandered away and they've just hadn't submitted their life to you and there's things that have entangled their life I pray Lord this morning that you'd help them Lord to make that move Lord today to get some things settled so that they can have peace of heart and they can renew their love relationship with you the way that it needs to be and they can restore that fellowship so that they can walk in the happiness and the trueness and the joy of Jesus which in Christ's name I pray Amen.